title that has a couple of key parenthetical phrases in it, which I'll indicate with this. LBJ's not so great society after 50 years, a poor health legacy. 50 years ago, Lyndon B. Johnson envisioned a great society, an America free from poverty and racial injustice, and full of equality of opportunity and social mobility for all. Many legislative planks of his great society platform, civil and voting rights, educational opportunity, fair housing practices, urban planning, mass transit, and health care represent what we today consider social determinants of health. This Medical Center Hour with bioethicist Erica Blackshur reviews how Americans are faring today in relation to key aspirations of LBJ's great society, especially those bearing on health. Americans generally live shorter, less healthy lives now than their counterparts in peer nations. And within the US, health varies dramatically among social and economic groups and from region to region. Now, 50 years out and in the era of the Occupy movement, which has called urgent attention to inequitable distribution of national, even global wealth, what ethical concerns are raised by significant health disparities? Are such disparities unjust, as many in public health assume? If so, what are our responsibilities, and what ethical limits might constrain our pursuit of a more equitable distribution of health? We're happy to welcome Professor Erica Blackshear from the University of Washington in Seattle to lead us in consideration of these matters. An, alumnus of, an alumna of UVA's graduate program in bioethics in the Department of Religious Studies, she brings a wealth of research and scholarship as well as practical experience in bioethics and policy around these matters of the social determinants of health and health equity. You'll find a brief bio sketch for Erica Blackshire in your handout. For those in our audience who remember firsthand the campaign for the Great Society and its promises for the health of all Americans, but also for those of you who only know the health-related programs that LBJ's initiative established and are part of his legacy, Medicaid and Medicare chiefly. This should be a rich exploration of a key aspect of American history with strong implications for today and for the health of the public tomorrow. This program is one of our History of the Health Sciences lectures, again, with history looking again at today and tomorrow. It's also co-sponsored with the Institute for Practical Ethics and Public Life, and we are thrilled to thank our partners in this program. Uh, welcome to Erica Blackshur, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing our audience's voices uh, toward the end of the hour. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Way in the back? Great. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming today. It's great to be back in Charlottesville. It's been a wonderful visit. Um, and thank you also, quickly, to Margaret Mormon and Marcia Childress and others on the Medical Center our Planning Committee for inviting me, and particularly for inviting me to be a part of their effort to mark the 50th year anniversary of Lyndon B. Johnson's progressive legislative agenda. Um, wherever you stand in the controversy over Johnson's role in the civil rights movement, whether you view him as a, a champion and strategic ally of Martin Luther King and others in the struggle for racial justice, or rather as a reluctant and racist participant in that endeavor, and there's a lot out there about who he really was right now, um, one thing is for certain. His name is indelibly linked to an ambitious, legislative agenda that sought to move America toward what he called, and what we now call, a great society. Central to that vision was an America free of racial injustice and poverty and full of equality of opportunity and um, social mobility for all. And let me show you this, since it's not response. Okay. And he, he thought that government could be a formidable force in realizing these goals. Indeed, he made 252 legislative requests of Congress. I was stunned when I learned that number, I'm doing some research. 
and Congress passed more than 200 of them. Each piece of legislation sought to improve the social conditions in which Americans grew up, learned, lived, worked, played, and aged. Now, I suspect that neither Johnson nor his very smart team of advisors um, realized at the time that this vision of a great society would also likely be a healthy society. Many planks of a great society platform are what we today might call social determinants of health. Now, no doubt Johnson and his team did think that the two major pieces of healthcare legislation, Medicare and Medipay, Medicaid passed in 1965, would contribute to the nation's health, and no doubt they have. Uh, but I suspect they, like most people, in the mid-1960s, did not fully realize that efforts to improve, for example, racial equality, educational and economic opportunity, housing stock, housing policy and practices, urban planning and mass transit, consumer protections, community engagement and action, could actually contribute to the health and longevity of Americans. Yet as it turns out, we have good evidence to suggest that more equitable societies tend also to be healthier ones. And that uh, brings me to my purpose with you all today. I have three specific objectives. I'll begin my remarks, given our moment in history, by reviewing some recent evidence about how Americans are faring on key aspirations of a great society, looking at poverty, social mobility, and racial inequalities. There are many inequalities I could look at, and the time simply doesn't permit, but we can talk about those in the Q&A. Now, these social conditions are important social determinants of health. So I'll then turn to examine more closely what social determinants are and the role they play in the production and the distribution of health, providing along the way data about America's health, looking at how we compare it to one another, as well as how we compare as a group, as a nation, to peer nations. And I'll conclude by posing a set of ethical questions that these health patterns and these health data raise, asking first, how should we ethically assess the health differentials? And specifically, should we judge them as unjust? Second, and closely related, how should we view our individual relationship to the structural inequalities that generate, that are implicated in these health inequalities? Are we somehow responsible for them? And third, how can we pursue a fair distribution of health, what many call health equity, uh, without reinforcing and recreating the marginalization and the stigmatization of the socially disadvantaged groups who shoulder a disproportionate burden of injury, illness, and disease. So that's a lot, so let me get started, because I want to leave plenty of time for questions. So to the first question, how are Americans faring on key aspirations of Johnson's Great Society? Let me start with poverty. When Johnson declared an all-out war on poverty in 1964, the poverty rate was 19%. A decade later, it was 11.2%. In 1994, I tell you, it was 14.5%. In 2014, it was 14.5%. It was down from a high of 15.2%. Now, the, the 2014, 14.5% was the first decline we'd seen in poverty since 2006. This leaves about 45 million people in poverty, just to give you a sense of the, the breadth. Um, it's worth noting that many poor people in America are children. Uh, this fact is morally important in its own right, but it's particularly important for matters of health, which I'll speak to more to uh, later. In 2013, uh, the, um, the number of children in poverty dropped from 20% to 22%, the first decline in childhood poverty since 2000. So about one in five children. And poverty. And if that sounds like a lot, that's because it is, at least we, when we compare ourselves to peer countries, other well, wealthy developed countries. Let me just show you this slide. I don't know how well it's going to turn out, but I'm, I'm sharing it with you for the, the visual drama. That's us at the bottom compared with what are considered peer nations. And I think it visually um, depicts the, the stark levels of childhood poverty in this country. The second question you might want to ask, though, is not just how much poverty exists in America, but what does it mean to be poor in America, right? And so let me share this with you. Uh, and one, way is, one way to sort of think about that is in terms of the daily dollars that people live on, okay? And so to live at the threshold of poverty, so that living on about $16 per person per day. However, almost half of poor Americans live at under or half the poverty level. 
So that translates into about $8 per day, and experts call that deep poverty. Now, two recent studies discovered that by some definitions of income, some Americans live on $2 or less per day. This threshold typically is used to gauge poverty in the developing world, it's worth noting, and it's referred to as extreme poverty. Now, there have only been two studies um, of this, and they've been fairly recent, um, recently done, 2013 and 2014, and the precise number of Americans who live in these dire straits varies, again, depending on how one finds income, from effectively 0% to 4%, the latter of which, the 4% translates into about 12 million, 12 million Americans. So we might want to next ask then about social mobility, the ability to climb out of poverty. So let me go back because I don't want you to leave that quite yet. So there, you know, so how much, how much social mobility exists in America? And as with all things, as with poverty, it depends on how you measure it. There are two primary ways to measure poverty. One approach measures whether an adult child has more money than his or her parents at the same age. This is called absolute mobility, and by this measure, more than 80% of Americans have more money than their parents. A second way to measure mobility examines whether an adult child has moved up the ranks in the income ladder. Do children born into poor and working class families become middle class? Do middle class kids become rich? This is called relative mobility, and researchers tend to call this intergenerational mobility, and Many Americans believe that this idea that a person shouldn't be confined or defined by one's story of origin is fundamental to the American dream. I suspect is what Johnson had in mind when he talked about social mobility. Now, prevailing public opinion and politicians on both the left and the right tell us that it's been declining in recent years. Yet a major study just published in 2014, based on the records of more than 40 million children and their parents, tells us something different. Basically, that rates of intergenerational mobility have been stable for the last half of the 20th century. So that's the good news. The bad news is that there's actually very little social mobility in America, again, when we compare ourselves to other wealthy developed nations. So let's take a look at a few <coughs> specifics. So the odds that a child reaches the top fifth of the income distribution, the very top rung, from the, having been born into the bottom fifth of the income distribution, so this would be a true rags to riches rise, which is mythic in America, are about 8%. Some 43% of American children born into that bottom rung are stuck there, and 70% of American children born into poor families never make it to the middle class. Now, other nations do better, even class-conscious Britain. Uh, so to go back to that rags to riches example, 12% of Brits make the climb from the bottom to the top, 14% of Danes do the same. Denmark has some of the highest rates of social mobility, intergenerational mobility in the world. Now, perhaps one reason it feels like social mobility has been declining in America is the rapid rise of income inequality. I suspect you've heard something about it. Um, among wealthy nations, the U.S. leads the pack in income inequality. We've reached levels we haven't seen since the Roaring Twenties, and there are so many graphs I couldn't decide which one to show you, so I just decided not to show you one. But um, they're out there, and um, you should take a look at some of them. So. Given that the income ladder has stretched, um, and as the, the, the rungs on the ladder have become ever more stretched, children born into poor and low-income families have a whole lot farther to travel, and as I just no noted, most of them don't make it out of the bottom two rungs. Now, one last thing to note about intergenerational mobility that was underscored by the authors who did this major study is that there's tremendous geographic variation in it. Take a look at the map I'm going to show you here. Okay. All right, so the very dark red areas, so you'll see there in the southeast and the industrial Midwest and a few dark red spots out to the west and in Alaska. Um, the red is where, there are, where you have the least mobility. The pale yellow areas is where you have the most mobility. Now the authors tell us that some cities, such as Salt Lake City and San Jose, have rates of mobility comparable to countries with the highest rates, such as Denmark, as I just noted. Other cities, such as Atlanta, Charlotte, and Milwaukee, Milwaukee have the lowest rates of any developed country. Now, one last finding uh, this research found is that intergenerational mobility is lower for both blacks and for whites in regions with larger African-American populations. And that brings us to questions of race. So let me turn there. I'm going to draw heavily on a 2013 report from the Pew Research Center 
that examined racial equality along a number of indicators. To foreshadow its findings, the report was titled, King's Dream Remains an Elusive Goal. Now, it's not all bad news. Um, in the three decades that followed the signing of the Civil Rights Act in 1964 and the Voting Rights Act in 1965, blacks made progress on education, employment, and income. Rates of high school completion tripled, college completion quadrupled, median household income also tripled. But when compared to other groups, the results look more mixed. And I'll say more <coughs> later about why it's important ethically to examine differences among social groups along axes of difference, such as race. So I'm going to look at um, a, a few categories of measures, education, economics, voter turnout, and criminal justice. Okay. So these next couple of graphs show you completion rates for high school and college. You'll see that these graphs include um, other ethnicities, not just blacks and whites. Blacks are represented by the dark, I hope that you all can see that, that dark sort of yellowish tan line, and whites by the dark green line. And since those are the compar two comparators, I'll just focus on those. Um, and what the graph on the far left shows you is that high school completion rates among blacks have nearly matched that of whites. Completion rates, which are mapped over here in this graph to your right, uh, tell a different story. Although, uh, although far more blacks complete college today than they did in the 1960s, whites are still significantly more likely to do so. In 2012, 34% of white adults had a college degree. In 2012, 21% of blacks, black adults did. Now, education is tightly linked to social mobility in a knowledge-based economy, and on that measure, black children are more likely to get stuck in the bottom rung and fall from the middle class into the bottom two rungs. So take a look at this slide here. So I'll give you some specifics. 53% um, of black children born into poor families the very bottom rung remain stuck there compared to 33% of white children. 56% of black children born into middle class families fall to the bottom two rungs of the income ladder compared to 32% of white children. Okay. And that brings us to questions of economic measures of well-being. So let me take you there. This first graph on your left shows that black white uh, shows that the black white poverty gap remains wide and little change since the 1960s with nearly three times as many blacks as whites living in poverty, some 28% versus 10%. Again, this are uh, relative to population size, so there are many more whites living in poverty, but as a percentage of the, the population, you get that kind of comparison. This next graph uh, shows you that the black white gap in median household income also remains little change. In the 60s, the gap was, just to give you a dollar figure, between black and white households, 19,360. Today, that gap is 27,415. Another way to put it um, that puts the, brings the lack of progress into sharper focus is this. In 1967, the average black household income was 55% of white households. In 2011, the average black household income was 59% of white households. Now, this last graph tells um, a starker story. This is wealth, um, or what is sometimes called uh, median net worth. Again, whites are represented by the dark green and blacks by that dark yellow tan color. And um, as you can see, the gap is quite wide. Those are obviously averages. So two last areas to look at. One is voter turnout, um, which caught up with whites in 2008. Why? We are very articulate dynamic candidates, black candidate, surpassed them in, and it surpassed them in 2012. No doubt Lyndon B. Johnson and Martin Luther King would be thrilled by this fact, were they still among us. Um, but I suspect they would be uh, stunned by the recent U.S. Supreme Court's decision to gut key provisions of the Voter Rights Act in today's political climate. Uh, where a number of states are instituting programs and uh, requirements, such as voter ID laws, that disproportionately impact minorities, jeopardizing their ability to cast their votes. I have one last graph to show you, at least for this first portion of the talk, and it speaks to incarceration rates. And what it shows you is that black men are more than six times as likely as white men to be incarcerated. In 1960, that rate was five times as likely. Black women are five times <coughs> as likely as white men to be incarcerated. And it's worth noting that the United States 
has the highest rates of incarceration among high-income countries, which affects not only those in prison, but of course their families and their communities. And this topic brings me to a closely related and final one, not to be overlooked given recent events, namely um, policing practices in minority communities and the unnecessary deaths of unarmed black men, and in the case of Tamar Rice, a mere child. Um, in, the, in the interest of brevity, and, and due to my inability to find adequate words to really talk about this, let me just show you a picture. I don't know how many of you have seen this. <laughs> Several of you have seen it. Um, it's the cover of the January 26th issue of The New Yorker, uh, titled The Dream of Reconciliation. And what it shows you uh, is Dr. King linked in arms and marching with Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Eric Garner, unarmed black men now dead, and Wei Zhang Lu and Rafael Ramos, two police officers killed in a perverse form of, of revenge. So these men's deaths <coughs> suggest some rather obvious blunt and violent connections between failed aspirations of great society and America's health. And while violence should not be underestimated as a cause of premature mortality, more on that to come, uh, what else do poverty, income, income inequality, educational attainment, social mobility, and race have to do with health? Well, as it turns out, quite a lot. Uh, one social position is a robust predictor of health. Researchers find dramatic variations in life expectancy and other key measures of health associated with education and income, race and ethnicity, zip code, rural urban differences, gender and sexual orientation, among <coughs> other social markers of advantage and disadvantage. Let me provide you with a couple of examples of how we compare to one another in, in terms of certain differences among us. So this is a this is a, a simple chart have a wonderful resource. If you don't know about it, go out and find it because it's in, they provide you with all sorts of tools to do interactive maps. You can go to Virginia, you can go to your county, you can, wherever you're from, you can look, look interesting stuff up, not only about health, but also about education and income and, and there's various um, approaches to that. And what this tells us is uh, it's talking here about life expectancy by race and ethnicity. So life expectancy at, at birth, on average, for African Americans is 12 years less than Asian Americans, eight years less than Latinos, four years less than whites, and two years less than Native Americans. Now, health differentials are even starker when various axes of difference among us are combined in various ways. So let me give you some examples. African American males in Washington, D.C. have a life expectancy of 63, while white males in nearby Montgomery County, Maryland, have a life expectancy of 8, that's a 17 year gap. Native American males living in a cluster of uh, counties of South Dakota have a life expectancy of 50 years, while Asian females in Bergen County, New Jersey, have a life expectancy of 91, that's a 33 year gap. Now, gaps in life expectancy are um, often reflect the fact that some groups are simply making greater gains than other groups. So everybody's gaining, but some groups are gaining more. But um, a number of recent studies have shown <coughs> that the lifespans of some Americans are actually contracting. Let me give you an example. So white women without a high school diploma lost five years of life between 1990 and 2008, living on average 73.5 years compared to 84 years for white women with a college degree. White men without a high school diploma lost three years of life during that same time frame, living on average 67 and a half years compared to 80.4 years for white men with a college degree. So there's actually some danger in just talking about stark uh, inequalities in health. Uh, it risks telling an incomplete story, suggesting that some people live short, British lives and everyone else Instead, what researchers find is an inverse stepwise relationship between social position and health, such that each step up or down the social ladder, there is an intended increase or decrease in preventable morbidity and premature death. This pattern is referred to as a social gradient in health, and here are a few facts about that pattern in population health. So the social gradient in health is robust. It holds for all 14 major causes of death, most forms of mental disorder and disease, and it's foreshadowed tragically, in children's health and development. And the social gradient in health is enduring. It persists over time, despite dramatic changes in the principal causes 
of disease. So as an example, at the turn of the century, not this most recent one, but one before, most humans died of some form of communicable or infectious disease, and there was a social gradient. And researchers showed there was a social gradient in that. Today, most of us die of chronic diseases, and the social gradient in health has replicated itself on chronic diseases, as I just mentioned. Let me show you some pictures of what a social gradient in health looks like. So both of these graphs come from the 2008 Robert Wood Johnson Foundation report, uh, commission, uh, the Commission to Build a Healthier America. And the first graph, in blue, with the blue columns, plots life expectancy according to level of educational attainment. The paler the blue column, the higher the education, the longer the life expectancy. The second graph, with the green column, plots life expectancy according to income level. The paler the green column, the higher the income, the longer the life expectancy. And these sorts of social inequalities in health are seen across a range of health conditions from the beginning of life to old age. Now this next graph I'm going to show you is, shows you a social gradient in health complexified by plotting both race and income. So take a minute to look at that and I'll, let me help you unpack what you're seeing. So each column color represents a different racial or ethnic group with orange representing black non-Hispanics. Yellow in the middle there, doesn't quite look like yellow, it looks like green to me, but um, that's representing uh, Hispanics. And the brown or burgundy represents, represents whites. And the columns on the far left represent people who are the worst off economically, and this graph moves in increments to better off, the federal poverty level there, the percentages at which we're, different groups are living. So as with the other group, groups, uh, with the other graphs, the thing to notice is that the lower the income, the worse the health. But notice that within income groups, there are differences by race and ethnicity such that blacks in the highest income group not only have worse health than their white counterparts in that same income group, but also slightly worse health than whites in the next lower income groups. Now, researchers find these social gradients in health wherever they study population health, race, and, which isn't to say there aren't exceptions and there aren't off-gradient clusters, but the pattern over and over again is this social gradient in health. So it does raise the question what explains them. Um, so let me quickly address two explanations that seem plausible on their face, yet upon examination don't explain or don't fully explain social, the social gradient in health. So one possibility, do I have this? Oops, I don't have this anymore. So one possibility is that these differences in health are created by differential access to medical care. Whenever I'm talking to audiences in the United States, this is the first thing that is brought up because we are acutely aware of the fact that um, tens of millions of Americans are uninsured or underinsured, and we know that having insurance is actually no uh, guarantee to uh, quality time in care. Yet as important as medical care is, particularly once injury and illness, um, injury disease occurs, medical care has little impact on underlying causes of disease or injury. Medical care can explain significant inequalities in the incidence of illness and disease. Moreover, as already noted, significant social inequalities in health, the social gradients in health, if you will, are documented in wealthy, developed countries that provide their people with cradle-to-grave health care. So no one is suggesting that medical care doesn't matter and doesn't play a role, um, but it can't explain, um, can't explain social gradients in health. In fact, I mean, experts have tried to estimate the various contributions of various social determinants of health and turn to next can contribute to overall population health. And by most measures, it's relatively minor, ranging from between 10 and 15 percent. Sometimes I've seen 20 percent, but most of the estimates are in the lower range. Now, second possibility is that people who are poor um, choose to engage in behaviors that heighten the risk of getting sick and acquiring disease. Uh, health consequential behaviors, particularly those related to diet, exercise, and tobacco use, can make a significant contribution to the onset and progression of disease, and members of low socioeconomic groups tend to engage in more unhealthy behaviors than their better counterparts. Uh, they smoke more, exercise less, have poorer diets, comply less with, 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 with therapy, with, uh, therapy, use medical services less, and tend to be less health conscious. Yet studies demonstrate that social inequalities in health persist even when behaviors are controlled for, when they're accounted for. And Michael Marmot, I don't know if you know the name, very prominent um, uh, researcher in this arena, um, whose health studies of the British civil servants, known as the White House studies, and which these were done in the 1960s and 1970s, which helped to definitively establish the social gradient in health in the contemporary era, has 
has estimated that health behavior accounts for perhaps perhaps less than a third of health differentials. So health behaviors matter, but something else is clearly going on, so what is it? In my introductory remarks, I, uh, you may recall I mentioned that key aspirations of a great society uh, were aligned closely with what I call the social determinants of health. So let's look at what they are. And what I'm going to do is there are many different definitions of the social determinants of health, many different conceptual maps of the social determinants of health, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to share with you one widely circulated definition that does something kind of interesting. It draws a distinction between the social determinants of health and what the authors call the social determinants of equity. And what they're trying to do is distinguish between the layer or layers of social conditions and contexts that are more proximate to the individual and those that are more distal, these broader sort of political, um, social, and economic forces that shape those more um, proximate uh, conditions and contexts. So let's go to that definition. The authors say that the social determinants of health lie outside of the individual. They're beyond genetic endowment, beyond an individual behavior, so the context in which individual behaviors arise and in which uh, individual behaviors can be at risk. They include things like individual resources related to education, occupation, income, and wealth, neighborhood and community resources, let me get you there, Whoops. such as the um, quality of housing stock, the range of food choices, the level of public safety, the level of political clout that a neighborhood has or a region has, the availability of transportation, the accessibility of parks and recreation, <coughs> Oh, I don't know why that little thing is up, but um, it's some making it go away. Um, hazards and toxic exposures, pesticides, lab, reservoirs of infection, which of course can differ by place, occupation, and group membership, and then finally, opportunity structures, things like quality schools and meaningful jobs. Now, the social determinants of equity, in contrast, are systems of power, they, say, they tell us, that determine the range of social contexts and the distribution of people into those social contexts. What do they mean? Well, they mean things like the economic system, which creates a class system or creates social stratification. They also mean all the isms we're acutely aware of. Racism, sexism, homophobism, and some other isms that structure opportunity and assign value based on socially salient differences among us. Here's one of, this is one of the earliest depictions of our conceptual maps of the social determinants of health. I actually find it among the more useful because as years have gone on, these have gotten more complicated with what I call arrow salad, pointing to things I didn't fully don't understand. So the thing to ask, I mean, if you look at that, you might ask the question, how do those social conditions get under the skin to make some people um, sick and keep other people, other people healthy? So I'll speak to some of the more obvious roots suggested by the definition I just described. Some people live in overtly hazardous environments, exposing them to high levels of crime and violence, physical toxins and pollutants. Some people work in jobs that fail to pay enough to live on, fail to buy health insurance, um, fail to pay uh, sick leave, vacation time, um, provide any sense of control or autonomy or flexibility over your workload, over your schedule. Some people live in neighborhoods saturated, or saturated in tobacco and alcohol advertisements and other unhealthy social expectations and norms. Some of these same, norm, uh, same neighborhoods lack uh, health enhancing resources that restrict healthy choices, places to play, places to exercise, food to buy, playgrounds for children to play in. And some people are exposed to institutional and interpersonal racism and other forms of discrimination and sort of daily, what, what's come to be called daily forms of microaggression. And, and so, unless these people are Zen masters, these people are stressed out all the time. And chronic stress, we've learned, damages vital uh, organ systems and immune defenses through uh, neuroendocrine and immune pathways. The, site, the physiologic chain of events cascade and wreak havoc on bodies and minds. Uh, resulting in more rapid onset and progression of chronic illness and faster bodily aging. Increasing evidence shows that the cumulative effect of coping with daily stressors of crime, noise, feeling disrespected, feeling intimidated, living in fear, feeling powerless in the workplace, struggling to pay bills, to uh, keep a, a, a roof over your head, and so on, can produce more physiologic damage than one very stressful life event. And when children are exposed to these adverse social conditions, the chronic stress and deprivation become biologically embedded in ways that compromise, jeopardize the formation and function of biological processes that shape the trajectory of their, their life and their health. 
Nobel laureate James Heckman, among other researchers, have, has shown that disadvantaged early childhood environments are robust predictors of adult, adult um, outcomes across numerous social and um, economic indicators. So much so, Heckman argues that the moral argument for social investments in early life need not appeal only to equity. It makes good economic sense. There's an efficiency argument to be made. So these causal pathways are still very much the subjects of study and debate. However, major reports um, by national and international commissions, governments, governmental bodies, um, agree that there exists strong evidence on which to act to improve people's health and lifespans. Indeed, many nations around the globe are doing so. And America has a lot at stake here. Um, not only does the nation have enormous health disparities within the country, as I've showed you, we also compare poorly in the aggregate to other nations. So let me share some facts about this. And just to note, my comparatives here will be either the Psalm 34 countries that comprise the Organization for Economic Co Cooperation and Development, or smaller groups, peer countries, um, all wealthy developed economies. So the US, US began losing ground relative to other high income countries around 1980. Between 1980 and, and 2006, for example, infant mortality fell from, we fell from 18th to 28th, and on life expectancy, we fell from 14th to 24th. Now, you might have seen different numbers than these, and it kind of depends on who's, in the, who's being compared to whom. So I always choose the most conservative of numbers, because um, we, we can look worse than this. Um, a couple more facts about how our health compares to peer nations that I thought were of particular interest. The likelihood that boys and girls in the US will reach age 60, the US ranks 38th and 34th, respectively. It's also the case that U.S. adolescents die at higher rates of automobile crashes and automobile crashes and homicides than in many other countries, and they have since the 1950s. U.S. adolescents have the highest prevalence of teen pregnancy, sexually transmitted diseases. We have for decades had the highest rates of obesity and diabetes. Uh, we have the second highest prevalence of HIV infection and the highest incidence of AIDS, and the second highest rate of heart disease. All in all, the Institute of Medicine commissioners. Uh, I'm referring to this report referenced there, found um, what they call the health disadvantage across nine health domains, affecting life and infancy, childhood, adolescence, and middle and later ages. So now you might think, given what I showed you earlier, that these poor health rankings can be attributed solely to the very poor health status of our disadvantaged citizens. But indeed, that is not what the commissioners found. Yes, that's at work. But studies show that even our better off, best off Americans compare poorly to their counterparts in peer countries. So um, this, uh, the, the commissioners found a pervasive health disadvantage that affects all age groups up to 75. Uh, is it, is the health disadvantage is observed for both uh, prevalence and mortality, for multiple diseases, biological and behavioral risk factors, and for injuries. So exactly why the U.S. has poor aggregate health in peer countries is not yet well understood, and the commissioners are very candid about that. Um, and notice that the differences for explaining our poor aggregate health might differ in some respects from explaining our, our health, health disadvantages, health inequalities within the country. However, the commissioners did point to some plausible explanations, some of which are going to sound very familiar to you because we've just discussed them. And I don't think I have a slide for this. Um, compared to peer countries, we have the highest rates of poverty, childhood poverty, the lowest rate of social mobility, less access to and thinner safety nets, and faltering educational performance. Built environments are designed for cars and not pedestrians. Agricultural policies and regulations shape uh, grocery store and restaurant offerings, offerings in ways that make unhealthy foods cheap and healthy foods scarce and expensive. Uh, contraceptives are less available to teens, and firearms are more readily available to everyone. And they note that stressful environments may promote substance abuse, criminal behavior, family violence, and physical illness. Now, they also point to two explanations that we have not discussed much, but which no doubt matter. The first of which is a fragmented health system with limited public health and primary care resources shown to promote, with a number of studies shown to promote health equity in some countries and a large uninsured population. And they also point to individual behavior, particularly this. Americans consume the most calories per capita, abuse more prescription and illicit drugs, are less likely to buckle seatbelts, have more traffic accidents involving alcohol, and own more firearms than their counterparts in their country. Okay, so I know how you feel at this point in time, our time together. 
maybe we all should breathe, I feel a little bit like that. <laughs> and this is why it's really good to remember something President Johnson said at a commencement address at the University of Michigan in 1964. He told those graduates, we have the power to shape the civilization we want. Indeed, the IM report does something very interesting, one I just referred to, and I rarely see this in such reports. It devotes an entire chapter to the social values, as our social values, as one explanatory category. Okay? And it, so this is important, it's refreshing, because it reminds us that we, as a people, collectively make choices that express our social values that shape the society we live and die in. Of course, it's an open question, right? whether or not we should reshape society in ways that reduce social inequalities and health within the country and improve our health as a group, improve our health as a nation. And it depends importantly on whether we view these inequalities in health and the social structural, social, um, the structural inequalities that drive them to be more problematic. And that green phrase makes my first question for you all. Um, and so the first question I would ask you to entertain is are these social inequalities in health unjust? And, are these uh, inequities, if you will, not just inequalities. And that depends, of course, on what you think justice entails, and there is not now, and there has been agreement as to the nature of justice. Caveat there, to be followed by however. A number of scholarly books and articles have been devoted to the question, and while their arguments differ in numerous ways, they, in my opinion, find compelling grounds for supporting the view that at least some of these health differentials are unjust, um, or violate key demands of justice. And while I have the time to go into these arguments in any detail, and doing so would no doubt put you right to sleep, I'm going to just quickly identify a few common themes that might serve as points of discussion. One ethically salient feature about these social inequalities in health pointed to by these scholarly treatments is that they are, to some non-trivial degree, generated by social, economic, and political institutions as well as their public policies and social practices. That is to say, these are social arrangements over which we exert some control, and thus, um, somehow our social arrangements are implicated in the production and distribution of health. And this issue speaks to responsibility for, for harm, in this case, these inequalities, which is a threshold question in considerations of justice, at least according to some accounts of justice. <coughs> so closely related to this question is one about a fair distribution. And the start gaps in health, it's been argued, represent an unfair distribution of important social goods. Now, theorists have quite different ways of interpreting what those social goods are or ought to be. Some focus on, for example, essential dimensions of well-being um, and count among those essential dimensions of well-being health. Other years focus on key social resources, um, social goods, if you will, and count among them many of the social determinants we've just discussed. And still others focus on another category called capabilities, which is a more complicated thing, but it basically reflects the relationship between social resources and a person's attributes and context. The focus of analysis being this. What can resources do for people, and what can people do with resources? However interpreted, though, these theorists tend to conclude that these social inequalities in health reflect an unfair distribution of important social good. Finally, on this question, related to the question of a fair distribution, is a third theme about who shoulders the excess burden of preventable morbidity and premature death. And as the data I shared with you show, People who bear the brunt of illness and premature death are those with very little education, few resources, and those people are disproportionately, um, though not exclusively, racial minorities. The nature of the harm done to these groups can be described not only as a maldistribution, but also as a form of misrecognition, which is to say membership in some social groups influences in a systematic way our social position and subjects some and not others to forms of treatment that lack basic respects. <laughs> and this is why it's important uh, to ethically to examine differences among us according to various axes of difference. And now my second question for you quickly. If we judge at least some of these differences in health, these health differentials to be inequities and not just inequalities, if we judge them to be unjust and thus warrant our collective attention and resources, how can we go about that work of advancing health equity, of reducing these inequalities without reinforcing and recreating the social disadvantage and marginalization of those who experience the worst health outcomes. You see, it's a little bit tricky. It's tricky because the work, the health equity work, requires that the vulnerability of these groups be acknowledged, studied, named, that resources be devoted to shoring up and fortifying their capabilities for a long and healthy life. 
And that word can recreate and reinforce a sense of them and us. It can reinforce power differentials and alienate those with worse health from well-intended people and institutions. I would suggest it's a non-trivial problem. Finally, and third, third and finally is what I meant to just say, um, a question for you all to consider. I've been puzzling on it for a while. How are we to understand our individual relationship to the structural inequalities that generate these differences in health? And if we judge these health inequalities to be unjust, then the question becomes, what is our relationship to the injustice? Again, it's tricky because the social determinants that are the subject of study as causes, right, as causes of these social inequalities in health, let me just name a few, social stratification, inequality, systematic discrimination, built environments, are macro-social processes that are embedded in our social, economic, and political institutions. Very, it's very difficult to, tra you know, to trace any one individual action or decision to the harm. Hundreds, thousands, millions of us are involved in recreating, sustaining, keeping the cause in motion, right? Even if we find income inequality, the level of income inequality we experience today, or find systematic discrimination abhorrent, even if we actively advocate against it, we, engage, we make private and public choices, we engage in activities that nonetheless are a part of these sort of structural, systematic um, cause processes. And so I, the question I ask myself all the time is um, how am I to understand my responsibility for that? I would encourage you all to perhaps reflect on how you feel about that. And so with it being the time that it is, and I'm talking about three minutes longer than I wanted to, let me just conclude by thanking you for your very kind attention. And um, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Erica, and you've given us a lot to think about, um, I hope a lot to talk about. We have a nice um, sized audience, there's a mic right next to you. Please identify yourself um, when you ask your question. Hi, I'm Mona Carney, I'm one of the general internists, and I actually run a course on social issues in medicine for the first year class, so it's very interesting to, to, uh, to see your presentation, it was quite excellent. And so, Tonight, I'm teaching a health policy and social determinants of health seminar to 12 first year med students. It's our first meeting. And usually, what I find is you don't have to convince people so much that there are health disparities and that the socioeconomics has an effect on people's outcomes. But the question I get to is that awe question that you put up there. And what would you have me tell them when they ask, well, what can I do as a first year med student or as a future physician to address this? I believe you. But now what do I do? Right, it's a great question, and it's the reason why, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. It's the reason why I created a course at the University of Washington um, for health profession students. And that course um, tries to help students who are going into medicine, going into nursing, going into public health, going into dentistry, going into social work, uh, understand and be able to talk about ethical issues that arise when treating uh, patient populations who are disproportionately uh, poor or minority, mar my members of minority and marginalized communities. And um, because what I was finding was that they were all on board, <laughs> but they didn't know what they could do as medical professionals, as healthcare professionals. And so some of the things that we, we do a number of things. Um, the very last assignment that they have in that class is I give them 20 articles from which to choose. They have to team up, and these are all strategies for um, things that healthcare professionals can do to better serve um, people without many resources or experiencing daily racism or whatever. And so uh, that includes everything from um, getting not only your medical degree, but working in your community to form a medical legal partnership to becoming a politician, to exercising your right as a citizen, to vote a certain way, to raise awareness. I mean, the, the range of interventions are numerous. And I intentionally designed that exercise to be the last one because otherwise students can feel deflated and defeatist and feel like there's nothing they can do, and that's never how I want to leave students. Um, but they come away jazzed, um, thinking, well, I'm going to go off and be like Jack Geiger. I'm going to do community-oriented primary medicine. I've had students switch 
from what they were going to do to go into primary medicine. Here, right here in this country, where we have, you know, nothing wrong, nothing, nothing, I'm not saying anything against going abroad, but um, the class often sort of raises awareness about some of our own, um, our own lack of resources. Um, so community-oriented primary medicine, medical legal partnerships. There are so many examples that I'm not able to just immediately bring up, but I try to give them, you know, at least you know, between 10 and 15 ways to think about how they can not only be a good and compassionate and understanding physician or nurse or public health worker um, in treating these patients, but also understand their role to be amplified greater in the community or the, even on the national scene. So that's probably a woefully inadequate answer, but I'm extremely sensitive to the question. And in fact, it, it, I'm now going on, but I'll just say, the other class that I teach, which is primarily for undergrads, but gets a lot of students going into the health professions where they want to become researchers, and they all care deeply about uh, social inequalities and health, or what we in the States call health disparities. Um, in the first week, I have to inform them, because most of them don't know that healthcare is not going to fix it. I mean, being a good doc is really important, and we can do a lot with healthcare, especially if we focus on, on more primary care oriented medicine, community-oriented medicine. Um, so, uh, you know, I break them down and then build them up and send them off to change the world. Hi, everybody. Uh, Hi, John. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, I'm John Aros from the Bioethics Center here at the medical school. Um, so, uh, I loved your talk, and I agree with everything you said. Um, but I want to uh, just expand on the the social difficulty of meeting the challenge. This is the other half of Mo's uh, question. Uh, you know, he was asking about what help providers can do. I'm asking what uh, us ordinary working stiffs can do. You know, what uh, what citizens can do. And I just want to uh, pitch the question to you in a way that sort of tightens the screws a little bit on the on the difficulty uh, faced in in politically responding to all this information, okay? Um, and for me, the, you know, the compare, a, a really interesting and sort of depressing comparison is with healthcare, okay? As you know, uh, Obama was the first person since Harry Truman to actually succeed in getting a rather threadbare health reform through, okay? It took huge amounts of effort, a major political controversy, and just barely scraped through uh, to give people a modicum of health care, all right? Uh, now, it seems to me that the political agenda accompanying the social determinants critique is going to be much more difficult because it really raises issues about the distribution of income, money, power, and political clout in the country. I mean, you can dash people some health care without really, you know, fundamentally disturbing the distribution of wealth and power in the country. You can do that. But I don't think you can do that with regard to the social determinants of health. If you're going to follow through on this critique, it requires a pretty fundamental restructuring. So uh, I just want to add some anguish to the Charlie Brown slide. Well, I've been in these venues with you before, John, and I, I, I thought you might ask a question that tightened the screws. So um, I appreciate the question very much and think about it all the time. Sometimes it wakes me up in the middle of the night, which is kind of crazy. But um, I, would say, I would say two things. Um, I missed that, but maybe that's okay. I just had to call me when you wake up. <laughs> you might be awake, too. Okay? I'll be awake, too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, your point is so well taken because I'm sure many of you know that Congress, for the 56th time this past week, tried to repeal, voted to repeal, what am I saying, uh, Obama cares, it's come to be known, the Affordable Care Act. Um, so I would say two things. One of which is um, I would point to what I've already mentioned with regard to the social values. Uh, that the IOM report pointed to. It's a very interesting chapter to read, should you have an extra few hours. Um, chapter 8 in that uh, commissioner's report. But I guess I would say this. It, studies have, have uh, shown that uh, Americans, very few Americans, some 25, maybe 28% of Americans, 
uh, have any sympathy for, any resonance with uh, fair equality of, out uh, equality of outcomes. Okay, in a way, this is what makes talking about health difficult, because health is a type of outcome, right? But 70%, maybe even 73%, forgive me for having those percentages <coughs> quietly committed to memory, 70% um, of Americans believe a whole lot in equality of opportunity. And I would argue that the social determinants of health that we visited are a form of equality of opportunity. And I think, I, you can't delusional, but that if Americans simply knew more about the ways in which these health outcomes weren't simply a function of health behaviors, people are choosing, and we can talk about what sort of choices are truly available to people, um, and, and the degree to which their circumstances truncate, if you will, the range of genuine opportunities and choices they have, um, that that maybe Americans would begin to understand and be more sympathetic, and 70% and is no trivial matter. Um, so there's there's that, and I'm, you know, I'm a Pollyanna maybe, I'm an optimist, but I continue to believe that Americans are a reasoned people, <laughs> and that if we could talk about uh, these matters in a, in a democratic, deliberative way um, without the skewing and the twisting of facts that um, more of us would agree and more of us could perhaps engage in the sort of political and collective action that we need to to make change. Now, and I'm not suggesting there's one solution. Um, there's been a couple of very interesting studies looking at um, politics, political traditions, and health outcomes. And I don't know that there's any one way to go about doing this. You know, America always has, always has to find its own way. <laughs> so, but I, I believe that we could do it uh, if we had good information. In part because I think, as I just cited, you know, most of us believe still in equality of opportunity. We just need to understand the ways in which these social conditions, these social determinants, if you will, function to inform and shape people's lives and deaths and the healthy experience in between. My name is uh, My name is uh, Todd Cooper and I work for the General Medicine Clinic. Um, I've always been in interested in intellectual history and I'm going to put the screws on even more. Okay. Um, John Adams wrote um, to his wife in the 1780s that two, no two leaves are the same. Um, no two things are the same at all. Um, all you can offer people is an equitable beginning. And then after that, it's up to them. Mm -hmm. So this, if it goes back that far, and what I'm suggesting here is that that sense of, oh yeah, we're interested in equal opportunity, but once, and we don't agree what that is, but once it starts, it's up to you babes um, in order to pull it off. And so um, that is in the very essence of, in my view, American culture. Now, there is a split. If you went back to your charts and looked at 1980, it was uphill to 1980 and downhill after 1980. Mm -hmm. Well, the people who didn't like the uh, war on poverty started a war on the war on poverty. And that's been going on since 1980. These folks believe very much in the idea that of personal responsibility. I grew up with a couple parents who believed absolutely it was your fault if something bad happened to you. Um, almost um, in a pilgrimistic way. Um, so getting by that, I think it's going to be hard. You know, it's interesting. So everybody optimists, let me say this. Um, 
there have been a couple of pieces written. Uh, well, I'll just mention one in particular by uh, commissioners from the social. The, the World Health Organization issued a major report out of, the commission, out of the commission on the social determinants of health in 2008. All sorts of people, and there are two commissioners, one of whom served a, a Republican administration, the other a Democratic administration. They wrote a piece about the social determinants of health and where we might find agreement, because they agreed that the best opportunity to invest. And this is supported by both if you're thinking politically about where we might actually get traction, but also scientifically, is if you actually had equitable beginnings. There's no greater place to invest than in a in very early life. And the science, the science just keeps building and building and building on that. So that's one thing I guess I would say to you, and maybe it's the only thing I have to say to you, but, oh, with regard to personal responsibility. I, I'm a big fan of personal responsibility. I just don't think we talk about it in ways that are actually constructive.